Monday, November 4th, 2019. And please rise as we receive a prayer from John Miles, the hospice chaplain at Prairie Lakes Healthcare System. No, no, there it is. Okay. I ask you to um, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Gracious God, our creator and the sustainer of our lives, we thank you for the gift of this day and the blessings that you have given us to enjoy. As our elected representatives gather this evening to conduct the affairs of our city, we ask that you endow them with your wisdom and graciously guide them in their decision making to benefit our city and its citizens. We especially ask your help in tending to the need of those among us who are less fortunate and whose needs are the most acute. Thank you, gracious God, for raising up leaders among us who are willing to give of their time and talent to lead and serve. Protect those who put themselves in harm's way to keep us safe. We pray in turn that you will keep them safe. With grateful hearts, we offer this prayer. Amen. Thank you. Join me in our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Okay. Albertson? Here. Bueller? Here. Hoyer? Here. Colleen? Here. Lalum? Here. Manti? Here. Rodemski? Here. Roby? Absent? Billhauer? Here. Why? Present. Thank you. Thank you. First item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Oh boy. Have a motion by Bueller and a second by Holine. Any discussion? Uh, Councilman Vilhauer? I would like to pull 1C off and have a little bit further discussion on that. Um, it, it's a large enough dollar amount. I'm sure we're probably not going to approving it anyway, but uh, I would like to have a little more further discussion on that. Okay, uh, we'll pull item C. Is there any other discussion? So I'll need to amend the motion. Um, Ma Madam Mayor. Oh. Okay. Sorry to interject, but that's 14 right. as well. That, you, we that will do it. that at the next, that's the full agenda. I apologize, thank you. That's okay, no problem. So we have an amended motion by Bueller and Holine. Do you amend the second? Okay, we'll vote on making this amendment. All in favor of making the amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries, and now we'll vote on the amended agenda. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries, and um, item 1C is the approval to write off uncollectible accounts receivable and remit to collection agency in the amount of $59,586.64. And um, I'll ask for a motion for approval and then we'll talk about it. So we have a motion by Vilhauer, a second by Lalum. And who can I get? Mike, is he still here? I think he took off. He took off. Okay, Kristen, do you wanna take this? Please. Yes, I can just give a little bit of information. This is actually the invoice amount was around $46,000. It's actually for commercial tipping fees at the landfill. Um, there was two separate invoices and the remaining $13,000 is actually for finance charges on top of the invoice. Um, this is to write it off. It is not to clear it. It's just to write it off and um, remit it to the collection agency. So if there's any questions, I could try to answer them. Councilman What is our normal collection process on any, any kind of obligation owed to the city? The normal collection process is we send out a past due invoice um, to the customer, um, and then they get another letter that's a little bit more um, saying your past due, um, and then there's a third letter that goes out from the city attorney, and then after we've made no contact and there's no payments, then that is the point where we write it off and turn it over to the collection agency. So we usually make three attempts. Those are actually made, I think, starting, I think the first actual letter goes out after 60 days, and then it's the 90, and then the 120, and then it is remitted to the collection agency after council approval. Councilman Lalum. Kristen, what is our policy um, on some of these commercial um, dump 
contracts, I guess it is. How, how do we how do we have anything? Do we have anything in place on that? That I am not sure of. I wish Mike was here to kind of cover that. Um, we have it quite frequently, and normally it's not an issue. Um, this is just kind of one of those that obviously did not work out in our favor. It's, I mean, it would be different if they were a local contractor. We know the business, where they're at, things of that nature. I mean, this is one that's unfortunately out of state. I do believe, though, that um, before you can receive credit at the landfill, you do have to provide right. your financials. So they had to have passed some sort of contract credit check application. Okay. Um, I think normally now that I do think about it, we do make them fill out a credit application and then the bank that they're banking with has to sign off on it. So um, this is a difficult one. I, it's, it's a significant bill, yeah. but um, it's kind of the first time we've really had one this big. What is our repercussions if we cannot receive that back? Well, now that it's turned over to the collection agency, they'll continue to kind of have that that battle for us. Um, at any point that we want to stop, that's up to us. But it, as long as we want to continue, they will continue to collect, to go after it as much as they can. And the charge to us for the collection agency? It's they don't actually charge. It's just they take a portion of whatever. Let yep. Let me get payment. Yep. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions? If not, I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item two on the agenda is the public comment, and this is the time reserved for anyone who would like to make a public comment to step forward and do so. This is your time. Seeing no one, we'll move on. Item three is approval of the agenda, and before uh, we get a motion, I would like to just uh, say that we need to remove item number 14. We're not ready to discuss that tonight. So uh, with that, I'll look for a motion. So move as Second. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Vilhauer and second by Lollum. <laughs> and um, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item four is presentation of awards for the Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities. And we have several members. Um, that will be receiving awards and Jamie Folk with the committee uh, is president I think and she will help me with this so I'm going to invite her to take the microphone which I think is on the table there and join me up front to give these awards. Uh, thank you, Mayor Karen, for inviting us and um, city council men and women. Um, I'm Jamie Folk. I'm the president of the Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities. We, um, throughout the year, we advocate, educate, and um, provide awareness to community agencies, community members, um, for various activities for people with disabilities. In the month of October, um, Governor Kristi Noem has proclaimed October as a Disability Employment Awareness Month. So therefore, we um, look in our community and um, we have five awards that we like to recognize locally and we've invited those um, recipients to attend today's um, city council to receive their award. Um, the mayor's committee had throughout the month of October went to their place of business or met with them to um, celebrate and to um, to give out their award and they um, are very fortunate and we are thankful for them that they will again receive the award the second time with the mayor. Um, our first award we um, we give it, we gave out for distinguished service. Um, he was unable to be here tonight, but that award was given to Greg Cook. Um, the award is given to an individual or organization in public recognition of extraordinary contributions to advancing the employment and empowerment of people with disabilities. Greg is the supervisor at Dakota Tube and has, em has employed and worked with several employees in dis with disabilities. He created positions within Dakota Tube so that people with disabilities can be em employed. Greg cares for his employees and will go above and beyond to ensure they have the support to be successful employees. Greg takes pride in training and helping each individual maintain employment. Thank you. 
Our next award goes to Kyle Gall, who um, received the Outstanding Citizen with a Disability. This award is given to an individual with a disability in recognition of outstanding achievements in overcoming a disability for the promotion of independent living and employment opportunities for other individuals with disabilities. Kyle is being recognized this year for it recognized as this year's Outstanding Citizen with a Disability. Kyle began volunteering within Watertown High School's athletic department in 2003. While in eighth grade as a student manager for the basketball team, Kyle's energetic attitude and willingness to help out led him quickly becoming a fixture to the Arrow basketball games and practices. Kyle continued serving as a student manager for the varsity boys basketball team until he graduated high school in 2008. To this day, Kyle remains the only student in Watertown history who has a five-time letter winner as a student manager. Upon graduation, Kyle continued to work and volunteer for the athletic department. For the past 11 seasons, Kyle has operated the clock and scoreboard at the boys and girls sophomore and junior varsity basketball games. When it is time for the varsity teams to take the court, Kyle heads upstairs to record the game as the team's official videographer. Kyle's impact within the community extends beyond high school basketball scene. Each September, Kyle volunteers his time to prepare meals for the disabled hunters at the Wheeling the Whelan Sportsman Pheasant Hunt. Kyle is a 20, 2012 graduate of the Watertown Police Department Citizen Police Academy. On any given day, you can file Kyle putting his friendly demeanor and helpful attitude to good use in the dairy department at County Fair Foods, where he has been employed since 2008. Kyle has certainly been a positive influence in the lives of many people in Watertown. He continues to have an impact in our community each and every day. We are honored to recognize Kyle Gall as this year's Outstanding Citizen with a Disability. people. Our next award goes to Char Lindbergh. She received the Outstanding Transi Transition Services Award. This is given to an individual or organization in recognition of extraordinary contributions to providing and de developing a transition program to assist students with disabilities as they transition from school to the adult system. Char has worked for the Human Service Agency for 11 years. She has worked in various positions from group homes, day program, and now after retiring, she decided to stay on as a transitional project skills job coach. Shar is mainly a one-on-one -on -one job coach teaching students with disabilities good work ethics. Shar is very patient with the students and has their own ways of teaching the students different tasks so they better understand the job so they be more successful. Shar is very well liked by her students, teachers, employers, and coworkers. In Shar's spare time, she spends with her five grandchildren, the five children and seven grandchildren. She enjoys traveling and has been to all the states and 32 NFL stadiums. Shar enjoys gardening in the flower garden and decorating her home for Christmas as she puts up 18 Christmas trees. <laughs> Congratulations, Shar. Our next award goes to Travis. <clears throat> On behalf of the Watertown Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities, we like to congratulate Travis's, Trav's Outfitters for being chosen this year's NDAM National Disability Employment Awareness Month Award recipient for Outstanding Employer of the Year. This award is offered to a local Watertown business for outstanding achievement in improving employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Travs has hired a couple people with disabilities since reopening their business in their new building. When a person becomes employed at Travs, they not only become an employee, they become a member of a large family. Trav and Mike are like patriarchs of the Travs family and take their employees under their wings while still running a great business. They are quick to give praise when it, it is deserved, but also look out for their employees well-being outside of work and will let the people supported staff know when something does not seem right. They have referred to themselves as the uncles and uncles look out for their family. Walking into Trav's you can feel the sense of family from the front end to the back end 
back room and every space in between. Along with being involved in their employees' lives, Travs are also involved in the Make-A-Wish Foundation and are known to personally follow up with their customers in our community. Congratulations and thank you for all you do for our employees with disabilities. Right, our next award goes to Brianna Dykes, our employee with a disability. On behalf of the, <clears throat> you get the whole spiel again, but on behalf of the Watertown Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities, we like to congratulate Brianna Dykes for being chosen this year's NDAM Award recipient for Outstanding Employee with a Disability. Brianna came to New Horizons in the spring of 2017. Brianna worked at New Horizons in the day program. By August, she felt she wanted to try something different and started volunteering at Prairie Lakes Hospital in the materials management department. Brianna started out with volunteering one and a half hours a day, Monday through Friday. Brianna was doing so well with this job that her supervisor at Prairie Lakes asked her to extend her hours to two hours and 45 minutes a day. At this job, Brianna worked on filling supply orders for all areas of the hospital as well as putting freight away. Brianna did so well with this that her team felt that maybe it was time for Brianna to look at community employment and to start receiving a paycheck. Brianna was connected with Volk Rehab and through services and support provided to her was able to do a few situational at Trav's Outfitters. Brianna's attention to detail and ability to memorize numbers landed her a job at Trav's tagging merchandise as it came in. Brianna started out working 15 hours a week. It just so happened they also needed someone to come in with a store opening that in the morning to clean. So within a week, Brianna went from working 15 hours a week to gaining full-time employment with Travs. Brianna celebrated her one-year anniversary with Travs on August 21st this past year. Brianna who ha has overcome a lot of struggles to get where she is today. Brianna went from needing constant supervision while working to full-time on her own. Brianna's determination to succeed is easily seen by looking at where she came from to where she is now. Congratulations, Brianna, on your outstanding achievement. And on behalf of the Mayor's Committee, there are a few um, Mayor's Committee members I'd like to recognize in the audience um, as a thank, um, just to thank the city, but Dan Albertson, who's um, city representative on the Mayor's Committee. <laughs> Stephanie Schaefer, parent advocate. And Shahara Rowe from New Horizons. <laughs> And it's not possible for us to do these um, uh, awards and um, recognition without the funding from the uh, Mayor's Committee and the City um, Fund support. So we thank you for those um, allowing us to have the funds for that, along with um, our other um, funding supporter is um, South Dakota Board of Volk Rehab. So thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yes, the um, five recipients of these awards will also go on to the Governor's Awards um, next June. So we do nominate them for um, the Governor's Award coming up next summer. Thank you very much and congratulations. All right, the next item on the agenda is number five, package off-sale liquor license renewal for Discount Liquors, Inc., doing business as Discount Liquors at 125 9th Avenue Southeast for the period of January 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. I'll look for a motion second for approval. Motion, motion by Lollum and second. A second by Albertson. And... Um, 
I should state that the reason that this one had to be um, on the full agenda with a public hearing is because there was a violation, so the public hearing is required. And the violation was an underage sale during a compliance check. So I'll, with that, I will go ahead and open the public hearing and invite anyone who would like to speak about this item to step forward. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and look for council input. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Councilman Vilhar? I guess I'd like to know. I guess I'd like to know what, what uh, corrective actions have been taken so that this doesn't happen again in the future. Hit the button, Kelly. Yeah. John May, owner of Discount Liquors, one of four. Um, since this has happened, we've actually implemented new equipment to where uh, each time a cigarette sale or an alcohol sale is made, it prompts with an actual pop-up in front of the uh, cashier um, requiring them to you know, ask for an ID and whatnot like that. We're also uh, looking at going deeper into TAM certification. Instead of doing it every four years like the state recommends, we're gonna start doing it every year for every employee, um, as well as we're looking into more technology. Um, just simple things like apps that read IDs and uh, making sure they're using them. So. Right. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or comments? No one? Councilman Bilhauer? Kristen or Matt, I'm not sure to direct to that. There were no previous violations uh, for discount liquors, was there? Not within this last year. This would be their only violation for this renewal. All right, anything else? I'll go ahead and ask for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 As opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number six is the second reading of ordinance number 19-13, a zoning text amendment to title 21 of the revised ordinances of the city of Watertown, amending chapter 21.1003.1, non non-residential height and placement regulations. Is there a motion? So moved. A motion by Lalum and a second by Manti. And I will, um, I think I would ask Heath to describe this before I open the public hearing. Certainly, Mayor. Thank you. This item is a uh, second reading. As you recall, the first reading occurred at the second meeting in October. And in follow-up to that, a uh, general summary of the action before the council tonight is that we're looking at amending uh, a section of the zoning ordinance that would help to better accommodate some of the redevelopment in the downtown district, which is what primarily makes up the C1 uh, commercial zoning district in our city ordinances. What staff has found recently um, is that the, the zoning ordinance requires a minimum 10,000 square foot lot size for the C1 district. And as we all know, uh, several of the lots and parcels that aren't platted yet but are legally described parcels in the downtown district do not meet that 10,000 square foot minimum area. So as we get people wanting to redevelop the downtown area, which has been happening frequently lately, um, we've run into the issue that uh, in order for them to plat that and move forward with their building plans based on a platted lot, uh, it's become pretty much impractical to meet that 10,000 square foot requirement. So we took a look at this pragmatically with the Planning Commission and came up with a, uh, what we feel is a, an appropriate solution to dramatically reduce that C1 lot size, minimum lot size requirement, down to 625 square feet. That 625 square feet was derived by a minimum 25 foot lot frontage. And presumably if you have a corner lot and both lot frontages of 25 foot each uh, were met, you would come up with that 625 square foot minimum lot size. That does leave only a hand, small handful of existing lots that would still be non-conforming, but it dramatically cleans up the, the presence of non-conforming lots that are out there today. And either myself or the urban planner, Brandy Hanton, could help answer any questions we might have as the public hearing is carried out. Okay, and this was a unanimous recommendation from the plan commission to approve it. Is there anyone here? I'll go ahead and open the public hearing if anyone would like to come forward. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and 
um, see if council has any questions. Councilman Holeen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Heath, would you just uh, remind us what will happen to those non-conforming properties? Yes, thank you, Councilman Holeen. The, uh, the intent would be, as with most zoning ordinance adoptions, that uh, things that are non-conforming that are in place at the time of the adoption of those lots, um, it's okay for them to remain existing that way. Uh, they would just be, they would be remaining as existing nonconformities. Um, now, you get into a lot of different levels of discussion when, uh, as, as things evolve over time and uh, people want to do different things on those lots, um, but generally speaking, they can continue the use that's on there today indefinitely, um, and, you know, until a point in time when something dramatic would happen where they would have to reconstruct or for some reason have to replat or address uh, the situations that currently exist. But w the use at hand today and the nonconformities that exist today would continue unimpacted by this ordinance um, until a triggering moment in the future would be requiring them to do something different to address those nonconformities. I might add to this that in the state of South Dakota, it's not required that you plat before you transfer ownership of land. So you can sell off a chunk, a tiny little piece of your property to your neighbor. Um, that doesn't necessarily constitute a building lot. But in the past, we've, we've recognized those as building lots and trying to be more um, methodical about how we move forward because there's not necessarily a building, right? If you sell off a piece of land that isn't meeting the minimum lot requirements. So that's what Heath was talking about, going through the platting process before giving building permits. But um, this is a step in the right direction. So do we have any questions? Councilman Lollum? Heath, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was only two properties that would not be in compliance at this point, at least as a first reading. Yes, uh, my recollection was three. Uh, Brandy can break the tie or the uh, conflict between us here. <laughs> I think it's two and a half. Adam was actually right, it was two. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and then I did look into that further t as well, and that one property that that was on the alley, it actually has adjacent frontage um, next, like right next door. So I think they probably just parcel it off for mortgage purposes. But so there's really only one property that remains that would not meet the 625 square foot requirement. I'm gonna and stay that's with my here. two though, because I made my answer right. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, yep, they are two parcels. So. Other questions or comments? All right, I look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item seven is approval of resolution number 19-46, approving and authorizing the plat of 8th Avenue Southeast and 26th Street Southeast of East Park second edition to the municipality of Watertown in the county of Coddington, South Dakota. I have a motion by Lalam and a second by Helene, and I would ask Heath to tell us about this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this area, th this plat, I should say, concerns the platting and establishment of the right-of-way over portions of 26th Street Southeast and 8th Avenue Southeast. The, um, the plat for this area, when it was originally platted, did not include right-of-way over the anticipated streets in this subdivision. Um, I can't necessarily speak because I wasn't here at the time as to why that was, but this has been a process now to get this to a point before the council as uh, establishing there's roads as public right away. The developer has built the roads. Uh, they exist out there today. It's the area generally in the vicinity of Trav's Outfitters, uh, who is coincidentally here this evening. Um, what this What's happened since then, since the developer built the roads, is that private property has since been deeded to the city, thanks to a lot of legwork from Matt, the city attorney, and the developer's attorneys. Uh, we've got those deeds free and clear, and we're now proceeding with uh, this plat that formalizes the public right away. So the plat officially takes the property we already own, because <laughs> we hold the deed, and dedicates it to public right away. That. Um, there is a difference between the city just owning land and it being dedicated as right of way. It gives um, utilities the right to locate there and the public has the ability to enter the property. 
So this is an important step that we needed to make and took a little bit longer than we thought. Um, are there any questions or comments from the council? None? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item eight is approval of resolution number 19-47, contingency transfer, fire department, and heritage museum. Motion by Lalam, second by Holine, and I will ask the finance officer, Kristen Bobzine, to explain this one, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's been a while since we've done one of these. Every year we have placed into our budget the $300,000 for the contingency. That is just budget authority. It's not actual dollars. It's just the authority to spend it. Um, we had a couple requests come through. The first request is to supplement the fire department budget. That is actually for an oxygen and they're here so they can go more into detail. But um, it's for an oxygen tank system in the building. So that's that. And then the second request was actually from the Heritage Museum. Um, I believe they are having an issue currently with their furnace. Um, the estimated cost was 7000 to do that, and they were hoping that the city would agree to um, cover half of that. So that's where you see the 3500 So if the council approves the contingency transfer, what that will do is it will increase those two line items' budgets and give the authority to spend the dollars. So with that, if there's any questions, I know Don is here, and the mayor can speak a little bit to the Heritage Museum as well. Right. Okay. So, Councilman Lalam, did you have questions? Chris, yeah, Kristen, um, is that City Hall building maintenance the correct spot for that to be if it's going to the Heritage Museum? It is. We have a couple of those buildings that really don't have, don't have a location. So sometimes the City Hall budget is what we call like the government buildings itself. Um, there's a few outliers that just don't have their own departments, so City Hall budget kind of... That's where we've 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 placed it before yeah. anything okay. maintenance related. I just it just yep. seemed to I know <laughs> one there and then Don on that one uh, is this for building one or the main station or the west station? That's correct. It's at station one. It's for a medical grade oxygen cylinder. Essentially, we bought this in 2007 through grant money that we got from pandemic flu funds, and we've been using it now for 12 plus years. And unfortunately, it's inoperable. And uh, over the last three four months, we've been using. Uh, local vendors for cylinders and stuff to to do our medical grade oxygen. It's become very expensive. If we continue on with this path, we'll probably be spending twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars over the next three years. So we feel that it's really good money, a return on investment to get this back in. And it's for our uh, oxygen cylinders on our ambulances, our five ambulances, and it's also for our D cylinders for uh, the portable oxygens that we go into the homes and in, in we go to in accidents and such like that. So is it like a refill station? Is that kind that's of correct? Yeah, yeah okay. it's a refill station. Yeah. Where's it located at in the station? It basically in the apparatus area where the ambulances are at. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Are there other questions or comments? I will add about the Heritage Museum that the um, there are two furnaces in that building which we own, and they're both out right now, and the. Um, Museum budget um, could use a little help. They're going to pay for half, and the city city budget, city hall budget, will pay for the other half. If anybody has any other questions about that, all right. I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item nine is capital outlay accumulations for 2020. Resolution number 19-48. A motion by Vilhauer. Second by Albertson. And Kristen, will you please explain this one to us? Yes. So as we do our long-term capital plan, part of that process is um, I take those dollars that are established and I accumulate the funds over a five-year time frame. Um, if you remember what the budget ordinance looks like during the budget process, there's a few um, significant amounts that are held. That is what I will... It's not necessarily restricted as we can't change it, but what we consider it is assigned. Mm -hmm. So this resolution allows me then at the end of the year, I will place those into an assigned cash holding account. So these long-term projects that we've discussed, when they come due, they have the cash available to proceed with that. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I should have um, made mention of the change that was recommended by the, um, or is that, that in that, the number next one? Yep, that's the next 10. one. Yep. Okay, but that would be covered in this, the, in the detail for this resolution. Councilman Vilhauer. 
Chris and I forget from year to year. We, we do this every year, don't we? We do this every year. Okay. Yep, this is part of the budget process. It's the first one is for the current year, then we do our long-term capital, and then we do this resolution that allows us to set aside that capital outlay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions or comments from the council? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. And item 10 is presentation review and public input on proposed capital improvement plan proposed capital improvement plan book available for review at the finance office in City Hall. And we went through this um, at the committee meeting in detail and Chris and Bob Zing gave the presentation and the council voted to um, remove the biosolids roll off truck from the sewer fund. And uh, the reason being that uh, we're gonna put that in the budget for 2020. So it doesn't belong in the long term budget any longer. Um, do we need to approve this? Okay, so I'll look for a motion and a second for approval with that amendment. A motion by Lalum and a second by Manti. Any discussion? All right, and I'll look for action. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number 11 is authorization for the mayor to sign change order number one Final with Dunnick Inc. for the Foundation Fields Project number 1911 for a decrease of $583, bringing the total contract amount to $30,279.50. Motion by Y and a second by Holine. And I will ask Heath to tell us about this. Thank you, Mayor. This uh, final change order is in relation to work done on Foundation Fields this past construction season. This is a simple uh, change order balancing the quantities to the as constructed quantities that were incurred on the project. Uh, generally speaking, the work consisted of reconstructing and new, new construction or paving of an asphalt road and gravel uh, roadways located at Foundation Fields. Um, it included uh, unclassified excavation, asphalt patching, um, some new asphalt concrete composite, and base course and things of that nature, along with some sidewalk. The work is now completed and the final change orders before the council for their consideration. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments, council? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number 12 is authorization for the mayor to sign change order number three for a timeline extension with Dunnick Inc. for the park and rec improvements project number 1819. So I have a motion from Lalum and a second by Albertson. And Heath, I'll have you tell us about this one, too. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a project that's been of interest for some time, uh, primarily due to the duration that it's taken to commence with the work and the reconstruction of the trail along 21st Street. Uh, we've removed that bike trail under the 2018 construction season and have... Uh, the, the process to repave that bike trail up out of the ditch and into a more appropriate location closer to the airport fence has been delayed because of uh, some platting that we're trying to accomplish on the airport property and having that plat checked off through the FAA. I, I gave a little bit of a history in the request for council action here that I'll touch on just briefly for the public's information on why this trail hasn't been paved back in, but uh, the city's airport property boundary was formally established in the recent past by an extensive land record search by a licensed surveyor with Helms and Associates. Uh, the benefit of having the defined boundary was to ensure airport property compliance with the FAA regulations, how we're using our airport property, what's running through our airport property, everything's accounted for appropriately within the property limits was one of the goals targeted here with this effort. In establishing that boundary, it was also determined there were several sections of city streets, pathways, park and rec facilities, and other public access areas that are not formally managed via the necessary rights of way, easements, or other appropriate designations for being on airport property. Um, the city recently ap approved a plat that would address the public street and pathway issues by formally creating the necessary right of way. That plat was then shared with the FAA for their checkoff. And further review, the airport land release process required by the FAA has been noted, 
and other means of accomplishing the public land designations for streets and trails is being considered. Uh, in a nutshell, we're trying to avoid all the formalities of formally releasing airport property if we can. That takes several months, if not years, of environmental impact studies and extensive uh, regulations that have to be followed if we formally release that land by giving it as public right away. So we're exploring a couple other options with the FAA. One of those options is to plat H lots. That doesn't designate it as public right away. It creates an H lot, which is commonly used in the platting world as a parcel of land that's held for uh, public pathways or future roadways or the existence of roadways. Uh, the other option that we're exploring with them is uh, possibly platting easements over these streets and this pathway segment that we're referring to specifically with this project. Uh, those easements, um, um, again, are not a formal land release of airport property. It's just an overlying use of that existing airport property. So it might be the path of least resistance that we could take. So those discussions have progressed and uh, in part have, have what's uh, taken so long to get this pathway finalized and rebuilt back to where we want it outside of the ditch, the flow line of the ditch that it currently or pre previously existed in. Um, in a nutshell, that's where we're at with this. I know it's a long explanation, but the road of this change order before you is to extend the time for Dunnick to complete the pathway paving uh, into next year. All right, any questions? Councilman Vilhauer? Heath, I, I've been asking about this every once in a while, and just uh, as recently as two weeks ago, or our, la our last meeting. R really, th th nothing has transpired since th that in, in the last couple of weeks, correct? I mean, you give us a pretty good recap here, uh, but I'm guessing nothing has, nothing's really changed in the last couple of weeks. Is that a fair statement? I, I believe that is correct. We did receive some recent communication back from the FAA that we, we, meaning myself and the airport manager, need to discuss further with the mayor and the city attorney on um, what they see initially as what some of our options are with those easements. Even with the easement option or the H lot option, there are potentially some uh, uh, reimbursement or equity type of requirements that we may have to follow through with as far as th that type of use on the, on the airport property. And those are the things we need to talk through yet. And I can't remember when that email came in from the FAA, but that's where we stand now today along with them taking it a step further on their end to confirm at the uh, folks above the, the peer level to check those requirements okay. off. And I've got, I've got a question on, on the amount. I don't recall that, I guess I don't recall that bid. Was that part of a bigger bid package with Dunnix that was a, it was lumped in with, because I don't remember this, ex, this precise uh, bid amount for that, that project. Yes, you are correct. This was part of a larger project that uh, I, I don't recall off the top of my head. And, and Colin Paulson, assistant. Well, that, that, that's fine. So, what, here, so it wasn't a standalone bid that we acted on. Correct. It okay. was part of a larger project. Okay. So the one hundred sixty-three thousand is includes other work. Yes, that'd be correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number 13 is approval of change order number one with J&J &J Earthworks Inc. to the airport improvement project number 3-46-0058-032-2017 hangar taxi lane expansion grant with a deduction of $48,423.55 bringing the total project cost to $661,166.53. Motion by Helene and second by Lalam. <coughs> and I will ask Keith to tell us about this. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the brief background that I have on this uh, particular change order relates to this, this project that began back in 2017 for a hangar taxi lane expansion. Uh, that work is now complete, has been completed for some time, but this change order adjusts the plan quantities to those that were constructed and is the final paperwork to close this grant out with the FAA and the DOT. And of course, uh, Airport Manager Todd Syrie is here this evening and we could help answer any questions. <clears throat> Just to take that one step farther, there was some warranty work that had to be done, so that's why the paperwork's taking so long to get done. So we got the warranty work done. Uh, this is actual quantities and uh, it's a pretty nice little deduct. Yes, thank you. 
All right, questions, Council? Or comments? Councilman Villhauer? Uh, Todd, our, our savings is, is, the city's savings is 5% is of that? Correct. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Item number 14 was eliminated. Item number 15 is authorization for the fire department to purchase a tender pumper fire truck from Spartan Emergency Response in the amount of $292,908 source well buying group. I have a motion by Hoyer and um, second by Y. And I would, okay, Don. Don's here from the fire department. <laughs> Can you tell us about this one? I'd like to ask permission tonight to move forward with this project. We uh, went through the source well buying group. This is kind of the same process that we did. We went through the ambulance uh, buying group with the SAVIC uh, buying group as well. Uh, they, those folks go out and solicit the base bid price for us and essentially get us the best price possible. Uh, so we'll kind of take a look at the two estimates that we have right now. Uh, this estimate that's on the first one here is from Allegiant. It's a dealer that works through Toyn. Uh, that's a fire truck company out of Iowa. Uh, it's a Freightliner 2020, and it's for $319,898. You know, uh, there is an option on this uh, fire truck. We're going to enclose the pump panel. It's obviously pretty good for the, the environment that we live in for the winter months. Uh, cost on that is $7,800, and uh, you can see the, the, the total price is $327,898. The second uh, estimate that we received was from Spartan Manufacturing. It's out of Brandon, South Dakota. That's where we've bought a lot of our fire trucks so far. Uh, that truck came in at $286,908. Uh, their enclosed pump price was $5,200 for, for an option with a total price of $292,108. Uh, we obviously want to move forward with this with uh, uh, Spartan receiving that uh, estimate. Uh, the total c cost is well under our uh, allotted uh, $328,000 that we have for uh, uh, CIP money for uh, next year in 2020. Uh, this truck will not uh, be uh, delivered to us until probably September or October of next year. Uh, this truck's going to replace two trucks. It's going to be replacing a 1989 uh, Ford that we have. That's a structure pumper currently right now. And uh, it will also be replacing a tender truck that provides water uh, to areas that we do not have hydrants. So this will be a two-for-one truck for us. This truck will also serve as a reserve pumper for us. Uh, if our fleets has a, a brewski fire, like we had all three of our major engine, engines there, it would be serving as a backup role. Nice thing about that is our ISO rating receives extra points by having that reserve pumper as well. So essentially this is a good, uh, uh, good deal for us. So... Great. With that, thank you, Councilman Lalam. Don, a um, couple questions here. You said they're replacing a couple. What are we What are we doing with the other? Are they going to to other local ones? I know we've done some stuff with Henry and. A absolutely, great question. We we actually contacted the uh, Lake Area Tech. Uh, you know, with the Med Fire program, they got a great program up there. Uh, this truck, I talked to a couple of the vendors, and they were gonna. They're saying it's probably five, six thousand dollars tops is what it is. And, uh, and it doesn't meet some of the NFPA requirements that are, you needed to have for a truck. Um, the Lake Erie Tech could, does not have the room. They wanted it. They really thought it would be great for their program up there. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't going to work for them. I will visit with some of the local fire departments uh, around here. I know that a couple of them probably might uh, step up and probably want that truck. What, what size is it? How depth-wise? I mean, is it a, it's a large truck? That yeah, it's a pretty large truck, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the tender truck is a 2000, but that truck was uh, basically pieced together, so to speak, by putting a, 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 a box on it that was built in the early 80s, you know. And uh, this truck, obviously, that we will replace it with will be an actual fire truck with a 2000 gallon tank on it. So the options are pretty good on it. Right. Councilman, why? That tender truck, was that the one that we had to replace a motor in or something a uh, while back? I don't believe it was that truck. We replaced okay. a, uh, a motor in one of our ambulances, Josh. Okay. okay. Yep. yep. But we did replace a motor last summer. <laughs> Other questions? All right. Thank you, Don. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Item number 16 is authorization for the zoo to contract the installation of perimeter fencing. And um, look for a motion. Okay. Motion by Vilhauer, second by Rademski. And Park Director Terry Kelly is here to tell us about this. Okay, this is uh, <clears throat> one of the three major concerns with the accreditation. Um, one, obviously, we know is quarantine, two is staffing, three was uh, perimeter fencing. Um, two years ago, we did do perimeter fencing around the actual zoo footprint itself at eight foot. Took out the six foot, put eight. Um, where we sit is the park shop on the corner of Highway 20 and 10th Avenue is actually part of the zoo footprint. That back wall actually, so part of the secondary fencing is required around the park shop. So this would extend from the zoo entrance down Highway 20, turn the corner of 10th Avenue up to the bike trail about the disc golf course. Um, this is a $36,400 job. What we figured this, and to kind of, this does come with a recommendation from the zoo committee as well as a recommendation to the council from the park and rec board for approval is to take park and rec funds out of the fund balance and the zoo restricted fund to finance this, to not put that impact on the general fund as the park and rec budget can absorb at least one of the three and, we, and the reason we're coming to you today is we have a contractor willing to do it yet this fall. And contractors are difficult to get in spring and summer with right. a June inspection. So we we're just trying to bump up that and ask for the council's approval to do a transfer from our fund balance, um, which is restricted to park and rec upon council approval in the amount of basically $37,000. So, and Kristen can definitely chime in. This is an eight foot tall fence. Yes, we're going from six foot eight and it'll be solid steel on Highway 20 and from 20 to the park shop gate because we do have, you know, rolls of chain link fencing, um, canisters of garbage that aren't really sightly along Highway 20. So we will do solid steel in that area, then the rest will be chain link. Okay, Kristen. So just to clarify, um, Part of the reason that I wanted this before the council is we're kind of getting down to the end of the year. Um, and technically, the budget was not there to, for them to proceed. So with council's approval to proceed, you will also see this come back at that first meeting of December as a budget supplement. So I think before any time we go outside of the budget, it's always best to get the approval, and then you'll actually see the numbers at that meeting. So. All right, questions? Councilman Lallum? TK, is that a local contractor? Yes, it is. In? Yeah, Mertz Fencing got the, we did price it out. We got, I believe, just two quotes, but they were the low, you know, it was under the $50,000 stipulation for bidding. So it was a quotation, and a local contractor is doing it, yes. Was it? Was there another contractor locally that was? No, it wasn't local. It was out of Brookings. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilman Vilhauer? Chris or Terry, in light of what you just said, Chris, as far as this will come back to us for formal... Uh, budget uh, resolution w will, will that impact the timing of the the work being done or we no with this motion you're basically giving Terry the authority okay. to proceed I just wanted your kind of authority to go outside of that okay. budget knowing that you're gonna see this number to approve it so when it comes back to you don't be surprised that it's it's in there okay sounds so, good. yep any other questions all right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Item 17 is old business. Is there any old business? Councilman Albertson? Uh, just for the council's uh, awareness here maybe, when Beth and John and I were on the Urban Renewal Board several years ago, maybe six, we were uh, in, instrumental in talking about the downtown area, fixing up the alleyways, working in connection with municipal utilities to fix the alleys and the parking lots. And it's it's been going very, very well, I think. And, you know, at this point, a lot of alleys are done. A lot of the parking lots are done. We have maybe one or two alleys that I'm aware of that are not done at this point in time. One of them being uh, the alley behind first, right out here, down the street a little ways, uh, and that hasn't been done. One of the things that happened, and Beth and I and John, I guess, need to take 
blame, if that's the right word, is that the city has been replacing alleys and streets with the materials that we currently have on that street or there in that alley. And the one I'm talking, one of them that I'm talking about right now, but I think two that I'm aware of right now, but one has been raised as a concern is a, is a gravel alley. Uh, the owner, or not the owner, but one of the landowners says that he thought it was, in fact, uh, had some uh, pavement behind it, but I think Colin was good enough to go look at it and found out that it really hadn't been. It was maybe some materials that had put on there that had been dug up and just covered the street. So it's not been covered. Well, unfortunately, then, the alley really doesn't qualify to be replaced with the uh, electrical wires and so on with the utilities putting the utilities grounded in, in there but that would be one of the one of very very few alleys that hadn't been replaced by the city at this time and just been replaced now the offices here have done a great job of trying to find out just exactly how that's happened or happening and I agree with it but I think it may be an issue that we need to talk about at a sooner than later meeting about whether or not we would be willing to because it's a gravel alley right now we certainly wouldn't want to have the utilities buried and then put gravel under it uh, gravel on it again it would want to have a better composition than that and so I would like to just make people aware of it tonight, and if you have a chance, if you want to go look at that, it's it's not going to be a very, well, no, I'm not going to say it's not going to be difficult. I suppose they're all difficult, but it's a wide open alley, but it certainly is needing change from what it is right now, and so um, I would just leave it up to Beth now because we certainly could have, should have thought, I guess, to... Uh, know the difference in replacing an alley that was uh, gravel with a different, a harder surface, but we didn't know that at that point when we were recommending the downtown area be redone. And, you know, I, obviously we're all tickled to death what's what happened, but I think we do have one or maybe two areas that may fit into this just because it's the downtown area, and with that I'll just stop. Councilman Hoyer. Can I ask a question on this? Sure. Nightmare? Isn't the ordinance the way that it's written right now that whatever the material is that that alley is, the business that put that in, whatever material they brought it up to, that's what the city maintains? So for all that's the other ones that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't think it's a, an ordinance. That's a policy. Policy? Okay. We, we, the council does have the authority to order any street paved. And we, had, um, in the research, found... Um, 1954 resolution that the council passed to require pavement of streets and, and alleys to be paid up front by the property owners and that was before we used to do assessment projects okay. asphalt used to be cheap and concrete was cheap and um, so we didn't assess that we made them pay for it up front and then we'd pave it once we had their money some sometime maybe in the 1990s or 80s I'm not sure when the first assessment project was done but we have literally dozens and dozens of alleys and streets in this town which were assessed to the adjacent property owners when they were paved and some of those were against the property owners wishes to pay for that they didn't want to pay for it and the um, the way that we do that process is uh, people can come to a public hearing and protest the assessment process or not. But um, to my knowledge, I, I found no alleys that were paved at taxpayer expense um, anywhere in the city, downtown or anywhere. But I did find records of some alleys being paid before it was paved um, and so that the, the property owners paid into a pot. And then when we got the money, we paved it. 
Councilman Vilhar? I, I just like to make the suggestion because I've been involved in some of the communication too with, with one of the property owners involved here uh, that th there's a lot of different facets of this whole conversation that we're, we can't get into tonight. I guess I, but I would encourage us to get it on the agenda at a, at a future uh, upcoming co committee meeting to further discuss this and kind of vet it and see where we go with, uh, with Dan's uh, suggestion. So I guess I would like to see it uh, come back before us as a separate agenda item at an upcoming committee meeting. Uh, yes, I think that would be good. And, and we did actually, um, there, there was a um, gravel road committee formed, which never met. We, at the time, we were between public works um, help with a city engineer. Uh, but we probably could take that up now and look at prioritizing. Would we do an alley before we would pave a, a road or should an actual street be paved at taxpayer expense before we would pave an alley? Those are some of the questions that... I, I, exactly. I, I think that would enter into the conversation too as far as where we prioritize. And yes, and, and we, we do know, I myself did the calculation that we have millions of dollars of gravel streets alone, not even counting the alleys, that we could pave at taxpayer expense if, if the council's willing um, to put that money toward it. We could also put it toward alleys. That's entirely up to the council if, if you want to do that. So um, yeah. I think it's a good time to talk about it again. Councilman Bueller? Yeah, I just want to reiterate, we, you know, we've discussed this on several occasions over the years. And <clears throat> for the benefit maybe of some of the newer council members, we, we've talked about prioritizing city streets. We had a map at one time that they laid out, it was really well done, that kind of showed all Thank of the, the small segments. <laughs> was that you, Mayor? Yes, sir, it was me. It, it was very well done. Um, Thank you. Anyhow, we, <laughs> we'd, we've been talking about this for a long time, and I know we allocated budget monies. Every year we allocated a, a certain amount of money that we kind of had earmarked for some of those improvements. You know, and, and, you know, I still get complaints from people. You know, there's the, the stretch over on 12th north of uh, LATI. Um, you know, why on earth do you have these streets that aren't paved? You know, and or avenues, whatever. You, but the thing is, I guess we, we, had to, we have to make a decision because we know some of these, the landowners are not going to participate. So do we leave them perpetually gravel or do we make a decision and move forward to do that? And I personally think that that would take precedence over alley, additional alley projects at this time. That's my opinion. Okay, and, and it isn't a choice of do they want to do it or will we pay for it? Yeah, I mean, you can order it done at, at their expense, and the council has that power, and it's not a very pleasant thing to do. Um, the the um, people can overturn that decision, but um, then it, it can go to a vote. I mean, there's a... You can have that battle if, if you want it. Um, but we, we receive lots and lots and lots of complaints about certain gravel streets. I haven't received complaints about this particular gravel alley except from the person who owns property adjacent to it that wants someone else to pay for the paving of it. And so that's the issue. But Councilman Bueller? Yeah, just an, one additional comment. Um, you know, I know we have also discussed traffic counts yes, as well right you know to kind of help in that prioritization right. method so um i again i i think this is something we really need to take a close look at and move forward with okay i'll convene that committee and have to revisit and and now that we have new council members uh, might have some interest from them on serving on that committee as well so look for emails from me <laughs> thank you is there other old business to discuss madam mayor Yes. Councilman Roby asked me to give an update in his absence on the uh, <laughs> Cherry Drive slash Cherry Creek discussion. Uh, I, I don't have much new to report this council meeting other than the fact that we are still working on the appropriate uh, grading plan and application documents for the Corps of Engineers uh, review for their approval for us to realign that uh, drainage way, regrade that drainage way. Thank you, Heath. That's um I think that's very um, remarkable of you to bring up that nag on, upon yourself. <laughs> Is there other old business? Councilman Alberson? Oh, I know what's going Seeing on. Eric Scott and others are here tonight, I will forego my, my question about the ice arenas. Thank you. 
Other old business? How about new business? Councilman Vilhauer? Maybe you're going to announce this, Mayor, but uh, t tomorrow evening is the uh, Williams Lecture Series uh, at the uh, fourth floor of LATI at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be a discussion of Upper Big Sioux River Watershed and uh, our own Roger Foote, as well as Mike Gillespie of the National Weather Service is going to be speaking on water year 2019, current outlooks for spring 2020. Open to the public, would encourage uh, uh, interested uh, individuals to attend if they're able to. Right, thank Tomorrow you. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. At LATI. Right. Thank you, Glenn. Other new business? Councilman Lalum. I believe uh, Friday the uh, there's the Watertown Hall of Fame will be inducted for 2019. There'll be four people. 11 o'clock, yes. Troy? 11.30. 11.30 at the, I'm sorry? At the event center. 11.30 11 30. at the event center. So if you're interested in going to that, there's four deserving people that are going in. So, Right, yes. Thank you. Other new business? All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Um, any liaison member reports? Councilman Vilhauer? Um, Update from the utilities. Uh, this just came out uh, just the other day that the uh, ongoing summer legislative sessions re regarding the territorial issue uh, for electrical service. Uh, I think it's going to be the final uh, hearing is being held this Wednesday. Or I'm sorry, yeah, Wednesday the sixth, uh, out in Pier in the Capitol Building. Obviously, the the, the more bodies that uh, we can have supporting our position on this. Uh, I think there's going to be a review of some draft legislation that will be appearing before the legislature uh, the, in this upcoming session. So uh, it's kind of an important session, probably the last one. Uh, but anyway, if anybody can make it, uh, it is this Wednesday. I believe it will probably start at, at 10 o'clock uh, at the Capitol building. Thank you, Glenn. 10 to 4 on that. Mm -hmm. They're looking to adjourn by 4. Yep. Any other liaison member reports? All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is executive session pursuant to SDCL 1-25-2, and we do have a reason to go into executive session to discuss contractual matters and economic development and discuss with our legal counsel on these items, and so I um, need a motion to go in. A motion by Y and a second by Manti, and um, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Oh, we do not expect any action. Thank you for pointing that out. No.